Welcome back. Today we are reading chapter 17 of Absolutely Truly. So, said my mother, cutting up Pippa sausages, Wednesday was breakfast for dinner night, everybody's favorite. Do you think you'll be able to join us at the meet tonight? Her tone was neutral, and she gave my father the briefest of glances. Let him find his way back to the family again in his own way, in his own time. The therapist at the military hospital in Maryland had counseled my mother. She shared their advice with Danny and Hatcher and me, and we were all trying to help her follow it. It wasn't easy, though, since we've progressed seemingly glacial speeds. Before, whenever he was home on leave, Dad always come to as many of our practices and meets as he could, but now that he, even though he's technically around, we hardly see him outside of the bookstore. My father chewed his waffle, swallowed, then washed it down with a sip of coffee. Maybe, he said, and my mother left it at that. I glanced at the clock at the wall. Well, I'm due at the library in five minutes, I said. Calhoun had thought our offer over and said yes, and my classmates and I were scheduled to meet him tonight at six. If it's okay with you, ma'am, I finished politely. Sure, honey, she replied. Just be back by seven, okay? I don't want to be late for Danny's first meet. I practically sprinted down Hill Street in my town, the freshly fallen snow crunching under my feet at every step. Passing under Lovejoy's College arched iron gates, I jogged on toward the library. I'd been to the campus plenty of times before. My brothers and I used to play hide-and-seek here in the summertime when we visit Gramps and Lola. I'd never seen it in the winter, though. And I looked around with curiosity, and I crossed the quad. The old buildings, the old buildings and tall, sturdy trees were shawled in white, and the snow falling in the soft glow of the old-fashioned streets lights lining the paths was like something out of a postcard. In fact, I was fairly sure I'd seen the very scene on a postcard at the general store. Students scurried along, bundled up in hats and mittens and scarves, and out in the middle of the quad, a group of them was building a snowman. I didn't linger to watch, though. It was too cold, and I didn't want to be late. Calhoun was the only one on the library steps so far. Um, hi, I said. He grunted a hello back. Hmm. I stood beside him, squirming a little when I recalled how Aunt True thought I had a crush on him. Crushes are right up there on the list of things I'm not good at. The last time I had one was at Pippa's age. Growing up with two older brothers didn't leave much room for crushes in my experience. Boys were mostly loud, smelly creatures who liked to tease and make toot soup noises and play practical jokes. I liked boys just fine, but as friends and brothers, not crushes. Mom and I had talked about it one time last summer, after we moved into our Austin house and Mackenzie started talking non-stop about Mr. Perfect Cameron McAllister, the guy on our swim team. I just don't get it, Mom, I'd said. He's not that interesting or, or cute, whatever that means. Really, he's not. She laughed. You'll get it one of these days, honey. No rush, though. And I know exactly how you feel. You think you've got a bad with two brothers? I have six of them. My mother told me she didn't date much at all until she got to college. And I guess I just figured it out. My feet were cold, and I stamped them, wishing Cha-Cha and Jasmine and Lucas would hurry up. A few minutes later, they showed, and Calhoun led us inside. Hey, Chester, he said, waving to the security guard. Calhoun, my man, what's up? Is it okay if I uh, show my friends around? The guard looked past him at Cha-Cha and Jasmine and me and grinned. Way to impress the ladies, dude. Calhoun blushed to the roots of his sandy hair. The security guard laughed. I'm just pulling your leg. Sure, go on in, buddy. Anybody asks, you tell them Chester okayed it. He waved us through the metal detector. From the outside, the library looked like just another traditional New England building. All white clapboard and slashed windows. Inside, however, was another story. I couldn't help gawking as we entered the soaring library. To the right, a broad marble staircase curved toward the upper stories. Overhead were rows and rows of skylights, and straight ahead the lobby opened into a huge glassed-in courtyard. Wow, I said. It's like being inside a snow globe. Calhoun gave a half smile. It made him look almost human. Yeah, it's pretty cool, he replied. Then the smile vanished, and the gruff mask slid back into place. <laughs> For a library, I mean. As we started to pass a bronze statue in the middle of the lobby, I did a double take. I recognized that nose anywhere. I drew closer and read the plaque on it, and sure enough, it was Nathaniel Daniel himself, founder of Lovejoy College and friend to all, his plaque proclaimed. Hey, that's the guy in the picture of your fireplace, Cha-Cha said, and I nodded. 
How come his nose is so shiny compared to the rest of him? I asked Calhoun. Chester says students rub it for good luck during exam time, he told me. I gave it a swipe too. It felt a little weird rubbing my ancestor's nose, but the Pumpkin Falls private eyes could use the lucky could use all the luck they could get. So how do we find what we're looking for? asked Cha Cha. Calhoun led us over to a bank of computers. I pulled the envelope from my backpack, took the letter out, and read the call number aloud. He typed it in and gave me a funny look. You didn't tell me you were looking for a Shakespeare book, he said as the results flashed on screen. You didn't need to know, I replied. It's upstairs, he said, and led us to an elevator behind the marble staircase. We emerged on the fourth floor. How come you know so much about this place? I whispered to my friends as we followed Calhoun down a long central aisle. Scooter says he spends a lot of time here, with Jasmine whispered back. His father's office is in the building next door. Calhoun stopped and pointed down one of the rows of the bookcases. It should be on one of those shelves at the end. We can take it from here, I told him. Calhoun turned to Cha-Cha. What time is our first practice? Saturday at 11, she replied. I'll see you there. He nodded and left. The four of us sl walked slowly down the rows, scanning the stickers on the books. <gasps> Got it! I said, plucking a thin volume from between two larger ones at the bottom of the shelves. I read the title out loud. It's called Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. Well, careful, it looks old, said Cha-Cha. Is there another letter inside? Jasmine asked eagerly, craning to see over my shoulder. I rifled through the brittle molten brown pages. Doesn't look like it, I replied. I went through the book again, then turned it upside down and gave it a gentle shake. Nothing. We looked at each other. Was this another dead end? There has to be something, said Cha-Cha. There isn't, and I could not hide my disappointment. Check the book pocket, said Lucas. Huh? He tucked the book from my hand, turning it to the very back, and pointed to a cardboard pocket, pocket glued in place. Lots of old books have them, he explained. Mr. Henry showed me. Before computers, it's where they used to put the book card that kept track of borrowers and due dates. It would make for a good hiding place. <gasps> Lucas, you're a genius. I poked a finger inside and sure enough, there was something in there. I fished it out. It was a piece of paper with two words written on it. Check shelf. We did, dropping to our knees and searching thoroughly. Nothing but books and more books. If I were an envelope, where would I be? Mused Jasmine. <gasps> Hang on a sec, I said. I've got an idea. Move over, you guys. Lying on the floor, I inspected the underside of the shelf directly above where we'd found the book, and sure enough, something was stuck to it. An envelope. <gasps> got it, I said trium triumphantly, peeling off the duct tape that held it in place. I scrambled back to my feet. Like the other envelope, this one simply had the letter B written on the outside. Unlike the other envelope, though, there was no stamp. Open it, urged Jasmine. And I did. My friends crowded around to read over my shoulder. Just as before, this letter also contained a quote. I see, lady, the gentleman is not in your books. It too was signed simply with a B. I read what was written below. Wednesday the 3rd, B4. So who do you think the Bs are? Asked Jasmine. And what the heck does that quote mean? I see, lady, the gentleman is not in your books. I shook my head. I have absolutely no idea. I do, said Calhoun from the other side of the stacks. He smirked at us through the gap of the books. But it's going to cost you. All right. We have discovered another clue, but now Calhoun is in on the secret. So tell me what's happening in the book. What's going on in your head? What feelings do you have about this? Hmm.